سوره الفاتحه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم before we begin i would like to take this opportunity to uh, extend my thanks to the uh, managing committee and the community for inviting us back uh, it's uh, good to see uh, friendly faces, inshallah, this evening we have an opportunity to rebuild those relationships that we began about 13 months ago, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillahi alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Khatam al-nabiyyin. سيدنا الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد الله السلام وعلى أهل بيته طيبين طاهرين المعصومين ولعن الله ولا الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد قال إمام حسن المجتبى عليه السلام الله السلام لا يوم كيومك يا أبا عبد الله صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد. أويتي سيفي يا إمام الزمانة. My respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters, سلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته. The hadith that we have recounted comes to us from our second Imam, Imam Hassan al Mujtaba, صلوات الله وسلام عليه. And is considered to be amongst the most profound narrations when it comes to the event of Karbala. Not only profound, but also one of the most commonly narrated. And often when you and I discuss the event of Karbala, we often go back to this particular tradition and cite it at various times, various opportunities to describe the event and how Ahlul Bayt themselves saw the event of Karbala. The hadith states, there is no day like your day, O Aba Abdullah. And this particular hadith is recounted so often and has become part and parcel of the writings that we often see on our walls. We see it often recounted on email or even social network sites. That As Muharram approaches and as Safa approaches, we begin to see this particular tradition narrated more and more often. This particular tradition is narrated by the Imam as, is he, as he is lying on his deathbed. After the enemy of God, Ja'ad bin Ash'ath, his wife had poisoned him to the extent that the hadith describes that he had even thrown up part of his liver. He had to regurgitate part of his liver and that he had used a stick and turned part of his liver over or that he had picked it up and put it in that basin and the blood of Imam Ali wasalam, is flowing down that drain. Having lied upon his deathbed, he gathers the family members together. And you can imagine that he begins to give his wasiyah, maybe as the imam, maybe to individual family members, to the entire group. And then amongst his final words are these words. Ya, uh, La yawm ka yawmuk, ya Aba Abdullah. There is no day like your day, Aba Abdullah. And this particular hadith has such weight for a number of reasons. Of course, the first and foremost is because any narration given by a member of Ahlul Bayt is one which comes from the inspiration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is from the divine knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we read in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these are words which not come from an ordinary tongue. It is inspiration by Him. And therefore, when we understand a tradition which comes from such a revered and purified source, the hadith has extra weight to it. How we use this hadith is of particular importance. Because when you and I discuss the event of Karbala, we are often given many questions from those within the school of Ahlul Bayt and outside the school of Ahlul Bayt. Our children want to know why we do the things that we do. Our youth want to understand this event and our culture, why we attribute so much reverence and importance to Ahlul Bayt and particularly the event of Karbala in the way that we do. Why is it that we adorn ourselves in black? Why do we cry? Why do we beat our chests? 
Why do some in our community go forward and bloodlet and perform zanjir? Why is it that we have such a love for Imam Ali wasalam? Why do we recount the 10th of Muharram in such a way that differs from every other martyrdom of anyone else from Ahl al-Bayt? The questions are from within and the questions are from outside as well. Because those who may not believe in the same way that we do want to understand we, why we do what we do. Be it from the Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah or be it from the Christians and so on and so forth. Why do we do what we do? The first answer should always come from the mouth of Imam Hassan alayhi salam. There is no day like his day. There is no day like the day of Aba Abdullah. There is nothing to compare it. And therefore, if there is nothing to compare to the martyrdom of Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, then there should be no exhausting our method of expressing our grief for this day. There should be no way which we are able to meet with that day because if there is nothing to compare with that day, all our efforts fall by the wayside because nothing we do can really become as justice to remembering Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Salawatullah salamu alayhi. And therefore, whenever we discuss this, whenever we introduce the event within the school or outside of the school, this should be the primary hadith. And in fact, this hadith is given to us, according to other chains, by Rasulullah himself, by Amir al-Mu'mineen, and therefore, obviously, by the second imam. Now, what we want to do is just break this hadith into three periods, or look at it through three angles. And then from the majority of it, as we conclude with looking at the third angle, talk about how we have seen the development of a wonderful new way of spreading the event and message of Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, how this has set a, a wonderful foundation for us, but what we can do in our communities to build on this foundation of what is the Who is Hussein campaign around the world. What are the three... Um, categories that we want to discuss this hadith la yawm ka yawmuk ya aba abdullah within the first one is the historical understanding of the day of ashura of this particular meaning of hadith what is the historical parameter when we look at the event of karbala historically how can we understand the grandiosity of this event then how do we understand it for the day itself how is there no day of the day of Ashura to compare to anything else in history. And thus going forward into the future, what was the effect of Abi Abdullah's movement? And thus, what is it that you and I can do to build upon the Who is Hussein campaign? The first one is the history. And when we talk about the history of Abi Abdullah, we would normally start with the discussion of Prophet Ibrahim and Ismail, peace be upon them both. Now the reality is the first accounting for the event of Karbala is not actually from Ibrahim and Ismail, peace be upon them both. We would start with their normally, but just as a point in reference, we have the hadith that state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, he is the first dhakir, he is the first recounter of the event of Karbala. How so? He is the one who recounted this event to Jibra'il Amin. And therefore, for him himself to recount this event to his grand angel shows you how grand a day the 10th of Muharram really was. And therefore, we even have the hadith that state, all of the prophets did their ziyarat to Abi Abdullah. Imagine, he hasn't even been born into this realm yet. And yet we have the hadith that the prophets one by one migrate and perform their ziyarat in the plains of Karbala. Biyu Musa, he tried and went. Biyu Isa, he went. All of them recognized there was no day like the day of Aba Abdullah. And thus with this, the great grandfather of Abi Abdullah, Prophet Ibrahim, he sparked this conversation. He allowed us to really understand, especially from a Quranic perspective, the event of the 10th of Muharram. For example, we have... Famously, within chapter number 37, verses 102 to 105 of the Holy Qur'an, the description of the dream that Ibrahim والسلام, saw. He sees this dream of him slaughtering his son, Ismail. According to some hadith, 
he actually saw this dream three days in a row. Because when he first saw the dream, he ignored the dream as if to say, how can I really see this event? How can I see myself slaughtering my son Ismail? And therefore I reject, I can't fathom this event. The second day he saw the same dream. Again, he said this can't be. The third day he saw the same dream and realized that this was an inspiration by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a message from him. And as such, he uh, comes towards his son and he says to him, Oh my dear son, it is as if that I have seen in the dream that I am slaughtering you. What is your opinion? Ismail alayhi salam responds and says, Oh my dear father, do as you have been commanded. Inshallah, you will find me amongst the patient ones. And so they come to this event where he must now slaughter his son Ismail. According to the hadith, Ismail says to him, Oh my dear father, put a blindfold, a covering upon your eyes, because I know as a son and as a prophet how much slaughtering your son will hurt you, how much it will kill you inside for you to have to see me being slaughtered. If this is the case and you are commanded to do so, slaughter me, but don't watch as you do it. There was no necessity for you to watch as you do it. And as such, Ibrahim places upon his eyes the blindfold. He comes to strike at the neck of Ismail and slaughter him. And as he strikes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously changes the sacrifice from Ismail to the ram. And as he places the ram there, we read within the verses of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we have given this sacrifice for the latter generations. Bidibhin adim. That this sacrifice will be recounted for the latter generations. As Ibrahim lifts the blindfold, he sees that his son is safe and sound. Despite him seeing his son safe and sound, the hadith says he begins to weep profusely, crying for what he sees. Either Allah Ta'ala or maybe Jibra'il speaks with him and says, Oh Ibrahim, why are you crying? Your son is safe and sound. Why are you crying? Ibrahim responds and says, I had pledged in my heart to sacrifice my son for you. I had wanted to know what it feels like to give in your way. I had committed. And the fact that I do not see Ibrahim being slaughtered, I weep because I wanted to know what it felt like to give a slaughter, a sacrifice in your way. Jibra'il Amin descends and says to him, O Ibrahim, look beyond those two trees. As he looked, the veils were lifted and he sees the event of Karbala take place. What does he see? He sees Aba Abdullah al Hussein carrying the son Ali al Azghar. In the neck of Azghar, the six month old babe, there is a three pronged arrow embedded into his neck. The vision he sees Hussein walking back and forth between the killing field and the tents, between the killing fields and the tents. The hadith, a separate hadith, goes a step further and says, that as Hussein ibn Ali was walking between the battlefield and the killing fields, as he was walking between the tents and the killing fields, back and forth, a voice from the heavens cried out, O oh Hussein, stop, stop walking back and forth. There is a mother who is waiting. She has anxiety. She has given her child. She has expected to hear good news. She wants her child's thirst to be quenched. There is a mother waiting. Stop walking back and forth. Return back towards the camp so her anxiety may be quenched, so she may know what has taken place. The hadith says, as he goes towards the camp, his young daughter Sakina, the sister of Azgar, runs out and says, Oh father, did they quench the thirst of my brother Azgar? O oh my dear daughter, take Azghar, because Hussein cannot bear this anymore. Take Azghar and return him back towards his mother. Now here we are forced to ponder and ask a question. Imam al-Hasan salam stated, لا يوم كيومك يا أبا عبد الله There is no day like your day, Aba Abdullah. 
we compare the event of Ibrahim and Ismail to that of Hussein and Azhar, and we ponder and say a simple question. Well, who on that day was greater? Who was greater between Ibrahim and Ismail? Was Ibrahim the father who was willing to give his son in sacrifice greater? Or the one who had submitted to death being the Ismail greater than Ibrahim? Which one? If you were Ibrahim and you had to give your son, would you be higher in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or would the Ismail, your son, who was willing to be sacrificed and stop his life short, would he be higher in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As you ponder, you will see the question becomes a non-existent question. You will see it pales and wanes because it doesn't matter who is higher, Ibrahim or Ismail. You will realize that Hussein ibn Ali was higher than both because on the 10th of Muharram, he became both at the same time. He was Ibrahim who gave his Ismail and he became the Ismail who was willing to sacrifice himself for his Lord at the same time. Ibrahim was one. Ismail was one. Hussein ibn Ali became both on the day. When we hear the hadith that says, لا يوم كيومك يا أبا عبد الله There is no day like your day. Even Quran can testify to this. Because Ibrahim was a sacrifice. Ismail was a sacrifice. But neither of them could become Hussein ibn Ali. And therefore every martyr in history, falls short at the feet of Hussein ibn Ali. If you are Prophet Yahya, you fall short of being Hussein ibn Ali. If you are Hamza, you fall short of being Hussein ibn Ali. And if you are even Ja'far al-Tayyar, you fall short of being Hussein ibn Ali. This is why in front of Yazid, Allah on the day in which the fourth Imam stood in front of him and gave his grand sermon, he said, we have been given six and we have been given seven. Amongst our seven great characteristics is that we have Hazrat Hamza. Who is Hamza? He is the lion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Hussein ibn Ali is Sayyid al-Shuhada. He is the master of the martyrs. I venerate Hazrat Hamza from my family, Zain al-Abideen says. But when I give my speech, I end my speech in recounting Hussein ibn Ali. O Yazid, Hussein is the one who lies with his head severed on the plains of Karbala. O Yazid, his blood gives him the ceremonial bath. O Yazid, it is the grains of sand that give him his kafan. There is nothing to compare to my father. As the Mu'azzin starts the Adam, the simple question is posed, O Yazid, is that my grandfather or yours? If this is yours, you have stated a lie. If it is mine, then why have you killed him, bludgeoned him to death, hungry and thirsty on the plains of Karbala? There is nothing to compare to your day, O Abba Abdullah. This is the history. When our youth, when the outside community, when the world wants to know who is Hussein, we start with this statement. Historically, there is nothing to compare to you, oh Abba Abdullah. Then you come to the day itself, the 10th of Muharram itself. And you come to the event. And we realize that the event itself has nothing to compare to it. But here we intellectualize and we highlight two reasons why the day is so unique. Why is it that around the world, the whole world stops? Why is it that color gender, creed, belief system no longer matters. Maybe, maybe it might be stated if there was the martyrdom of Jesus Christ. We don't believe in it. But for the sake of our Christian brothers, let us engage in the dialogue. For the sake of Christianity, we recognize that you have the belief in Jesus Christ and His own crucifixion. But the crucifixion appears to stop short and only appeals to the Christians. Do you find the Jews commemorating? Do you find the Muslims commemorating? No. 
the martyrdom, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, if it happened in that way, is for a particular community. Whereas the martyrdom of Hussein ibn Ali transcends boundaries. We have our Sunni brothers that respect and come. We have seen our Hindu brothers and sisters come, don't they, and respect. We see the world giving respect to Hussein ibn Ali. This martyrdom on the 10th of Muharram transcends boundaries. It doesn't matter, black, white, yellow, Iranian, Pakistani, Khoja, it doesn't matter. We bow at this particular day because of what happened. Why do we come? Because each of us have something to meet with that particular martyrdom. Each of us have something that we react to on that day. If I am a brother, I recognize that on that day, I empathize between the relationship of Hussein ibn Ali and Sayyidah Zainab. Because as a brother, it is too difficult for me to verbalize what it means to embrace my sister. True? No one can really verbalize that feeling between a brother and a sister. How much a sister does for you. How she will wake up early for you. How she will cook clean. She may have looked after you from the youngest of age. There is nothing you can verbalize. Imagine how Sayyidah Zainab looked after Hussein ibn Ali. And when they embraced, my heart quivers. My lip shakes. My heart is moved. My mind is baffled between the relationship of these two. One dhakir says, I imagine on the 10th of Muharram, as Hussein ibn Ali was being slaughtered, I imagine that as Sayyidah Zainab ascended the tilla, she must have stated, My Lord, raise tilla higher so I may have a better vision of my brother in his last moments. And I imagine as the earth trembled and wanted to listen to Sayyidah Zainab, because the earth cannot say no to Sayyidah Zainab, I imagine that Hussein ibn Ali said, O oh earth, Lower yourself because I do not want my sister to see me in this final moment. Imagine, this is the relationship of the brother and sister. I arrive at that point where on that day I become Hussein or I become Zainab. Or if I'm a father, my God, if I'm a father, I can empathize and begin to really believe the story of Akbar or Azgar. Akbar is walking out from the battlefield. Hussein ibn Ali is walking step by step. He says to him, O oh Akbar, as you enter, turn round every few seconds. Let me see your face. Because a father longs to see you. Only a father can understand that statement. A son can't really understand it, can he? He can't really empathize with it because he's not a father. Yet that is why Akbar asked, O oh father, why do you follow me into the battlefield? Hussein responds in the maqtal and said, O oh Akbar, if you had a son like my Akbar, you would not be asking such a question. I become Akbar, or I become. Or if I am an uncle who has a nephew, and I hear the story of Qasim, how much an uncle wants to do for his nephew. And then, and then if I am a mother, my God, where do we stop? Where do we begin and where do we stop? If I am a mother, which story do I begin to recount? Do I recount the story of Sakina? Do I recount the story of Azhar, a babe who is still feeding from the mother? Every martyr is unique in every single way. Why is it the story of Akbar is unique to Azhar, different to Abbas, different to Sakina? Simply because each of us can arrive at a point of understanding the story emotionally with at least one of those martyrs. One of those martyrs shakes me more than any other. This day, there is no day like your day, O oh Abba Abdullah. There's nothing to compare to it. Which day do you see martyrs of a different ilk, of a different pedestal, each giving their way in a different way? And this is why, this is why, all of us, all of us hope to be Habib ibn Madahir. Or we all hope to be Hur ibn Yazid al-Layahi. My Lord, 
There is no one on this world worse than me. I recognize my sins. But if you allowed Hur, the one who brought the army of Hussein to Karbala, stopped him from drinking water, when pigs and dogs drank from the river Furat, if you have allowed Hur to reach the heights in which he have reached, allow me to reach one iota of what Hur has reached. I cannot have done anything that what Hur did. We enter at something with the tenth of Muharram. And therefore, Ashura is a university within itself. There is no lesson which cannot be found from the beginning of the event of Ashura to the event at the end of Ashura. From the time the ambassador of Hussein ibn Ali, Muslim ibn Aqil, leaves to the time Ahl al-Bayt arrive back in Medina, the entirety of Islam can be found within that particular era. That movement, everything is found. There is not anything that is devoid. If you want to understand the value of Salah, look on the tenth of Muharram. There is a raging battle, but they stop the battle to pray on time. What does that tell us? Silat al-Raham. The importance of family. There is one on the 10th of Muharram that addressed Abu Fadl Abbas and said, Oh Abbas, you are a cousin of ours. We give you safe passage. Leave. Go safely. Abbas alayhi salam responded and said, You give me safe passage? Whilst you don't give Hussein ibn Ali, the grandson of Rasulullah, safe passage? What lesson is devoid on the 10th of Muharram? Muharram is a university for us from start to finish. La yawm ka yawmuk ya Aba Abdullah. There is no day like your day, O Aba Abdullah. And then comes the future. And then comes how we commemorate this event. How it reverberates around time and space. And how it penetrates every issue in the existence of humanity. We will say in our community we will normally state that the event of Karbala saved Islam, correct? We will say that the martyrdom of Hussein ibn Ali, the sermons of Sayyid Zainab and Imam Zain al-Abideen, may Allah's blessings be upon all of them and grant us the intercession of all of them, we will say their actions saved Islam. Why? Because the evil tyrant himself, the caliph of the time, he openly admitted that he didn't even believe in Islam. He was an open kafir of the worst kind. No revelation came. Banu Hashim played with the kingdom in their hands. He openly drank. He openly fornicated. He openly played with kids. He placed the head of the grandson of Rasulullah on a golden plate where alcohol was on it. In his drunkard state, he tipped the wine over and wine and najasat mixed with the purest thing in existence, which was the head of Hussein. Is there anything more disgusting? Is there anything more absurd in Islamic history than this? It didn't even stop there. He took a stick, a stick, and poked the teeth of Hussein ibn Ali and joked and said, what good teeth you have, O Hussein. This was this individual. He would have destroyed Islam had he had had a chance. There is no takbirat al-ihram, Allahu Akbar, to start your salah that is raised around the world. There is no recitation of Quran that is raised around the world. There is no ihram that is put on around the world except that it occurs because of the sacrifice of Hussein ibn Ali on the 10th of Muharram. This is a fact. Let no Muslim dispute this. Otherwise, they have not understood the 10th of Muharram. This is what Ashura did. It saved it because the world, the Islamic world, became in a state of tumult. Everything reverberated around this event. Now, What was the reaction of this? Islam grew. Islam became stronger. There was no longer this desire to keep the barbaric nature of Khilafat alive. We want 
to go back to what Rasulullah had commenced. What did Abi Abdullah state in his mission statement? إِنِّي لَمْ أَخْرُجْ أَشِّرًا وَلَا بَطِلًا وَلَا مُسِّدًا وَلَا ظَالِمًا وَإِنَّمَا أَخْرُجُ الْإِصْلَاحِ فِي أُمَّةِ جَدِّي مُحَمَّدٍ وَأَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ all I want is to bring about reformation in the ummah of my grandfather Rasulullah and my father Ali ibn Abi Talib. Could Hussein ibn Ali ever fail in his mission? Islam became alive again. That was the future. But I'll give you something more than this. I will say Islam not only was saved. I will say humanity itself was saved. I will say every religion was saved, whether you realize it or not. Whether they realize it or not, every religion is dependent and has been dependent upon the movement of Abi Abdullah al-Hussein. Why? Because the fact that Islam became stronger, the fact that as a religion it became stronger, the fact that as a theological movement, as a philosophical movement, as an ethical movement, as a movement that had tafsir of its own holy book, the fact that all of this gained currency, strength, what would be the reaction of the other religions to these issues? The fact that Islam grew under the imamate of Ahlul Bayt and the scholars and the leaders, what needed to become a reaction from the other religions? As a reaction, Christianity needed to become stronger. Otherwise, there would be no reason for Christianity to exist. If the priests couldn't have a rival theology, if the priests couldn't have a rich philosophy, a rich commentary of the Bible, who would have remained Christian at that time? Islam grows. Christianity needs to grow at the same time to keep up pace with it. Otherwise, the followers wane until today. The same thing once Christianity becomes stronger, Judaism must also become stronger. They need to have their own stronger theological system, their own strong eschatology, their own strong ethical system. Every movement became a reaction to the movement of Islam. And the reaction of Islam was a movement in reaction to the tent of Muharram. Everything was a domino effect. And its starting point was the entrance into the the plains of Karbala. Now with this, we live in a wonderful era where the world is a global community, where we have technology at our fingertips, where we have wealth to be able to distribute and apply into the projects of the time. What we have seen around us sparked from the mindset and the brainchild of Sheikh Abbas Jafar. May Allah bless him for his project and the other minds who created this project was that which we have come to call The Who is Hussein project. The mind was, why don't we introduce Hussein ibn Ali to mankind? No longer do we want this divine human being, this ultimate peak of humanity, to remain within the Shia or the Muslim world. We want this individual to be exported to the rest of humanity. The question is how? And we have seen... The starting point where scholars, speakers have got together, articles have been written, a concept that has been floated to challenge the intellect, simple rhetorical statements. What do you stand for in life? Once you have figured it, let us show you what someone else has stood for. Or the fact that you haven't arrived at your own conclusion Let us inspire you with the grand inspiration of what this man stood for. Who is Hussein? And what the speakers did was that they didn't say religious terms. If you notice on the videos, no speaker used the word alayhi salam. Because that is something that is unique to our thought process, isn't it? So we don't want to use Arabic because the moment you use a language that is not understood, you put a barrier let us make a series of videos that is universally applicable. Let us understand the question, what do you understand of faith? Let us speak of Hussein in faith. What do you understand of sacrifice? Let us speak of Hussein in sacrifice. But all this 
has reached out to build a foundation. It is not the finality. This is the beginning, not the end. And therefore the question should be posed is, not no longer, how can I only promote who is Hussein? What can I do to build on who is Hussein? And that is what we want to inspire our youth, our brothers and sisters, all of us in the community to partake with him. Now here, each community differs in its culture, in its education, and therefore obviously we need to reach out to each community at their own level. For example, in New York or in London, we might be able to reach out to a community on a more intellectual basis. Whereas in other communities, where they are, they may be on a more emotive basis. They need to understand the story of Hussein ibn Ali. And therefore, you and I need to ponder as to what we can do in our time. Every movement that has ever become a success has always been a grassroots, organic movement. The beauty of who is Hussein is that it should appeal to the mass Because today in the world, the mass themselves are ideologically aligning themselves with who is Hussein, whether they realize it or not. Around the world, as an example, there are movements that are taking place organically, that are speaking, calling out for political, economic and moral revolution. A few examples, if you allow me to indulge. For example... We have what happened here recently and around the world recently, the grand movement which was known as Occupy. Occupy was an organic, roots-based movement. Did Muslims start this movement? Who was it? Atheists, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, around the world. Hundreds, if not thousands of cities to the extent that hundreds of thousands of people gathered constantly in order to demand for social revolution, for economic revolution. We are the 99 percenters. There is one percent that is dictating to us around the world, keeping us at this point of subjugation. We demand economic justice. Now, this wasn't a Muslim movement. But it was a pure movement. It was a godly movement. They didn't do it in the name of God. They did it in the name of justice. Or for an example, when that young Pakistani girl, may Allah bless her, she was recently, I think two days ago, discharged from a hospital in London. She went and she demanded education. It's not much. We're not asking for a lot here. I'm asking for education for women in Pakistan. How did she receive a reaction from Taliban, they shot her in the head, correct? Imagine, Ali al-Azhar cried out for water. They shot him in the neck with an arrow. This young girl asked for education. They shot her in the head with a bullet. Can you see how truth is and how falsity is? How one is synonymous with the other? Truth is synonymous with truth. It doesn't matter who asks. Truth is synonymous with it. And evil and falsity is synonymous with evils and falsity. And then we had that despicable, inhumane rape of that girl in India. May Allah bless all of them. And we stand alongside them in solidarity. The evil, most despicable thing they could imagine, to the extent that Even Satan himself is disgusted by that action. Even Satan himself is bewildered how the human being can arrive at such a level of being such a beast. The whole world stood together with this girl. The whole world stood together with this girl. Sayyida Ruqayya, Bibi Sakina, slapped, earrings torn from her ears. What did she say to Shimmer? What did she say to Khuli? If you had only asked for my earrings, I would have given them to you. Do you not know who we are, Ahlul Bayt? If you only asked, I would have given them. You've just killed my father. I would have given you whatever you asked for. 
this whole world is beginning to rise. It is demanding political justice, social justice, ethical justice, equilibrium between people. There is goodness taking place. The world is looking for a true superhero. Who is the individual that we want to introduce? Hussein ibn Ali. It is asking for it. It is looking for someone to turn to and have confidence in. The problem is that they don't know of this individual. The grassroots is where we need to tackle. What can we do? We can meet, we can meet with the schools. We can meet with the churches, the synagogues, the mosques. You know why? Even the Muslims don't know who Hussein ibn Ali is. Correct? Fair? With respect, even they don't know who he is. Otherwise, they wouldn't be saying, how are you doing ma'atam? They would be standing here doing ma'atam with us. They wouldn't be asking, why are you crying? They would be reciting the musibah before we have the opportunity to recite the musibah. If only we had done the job of introducing Hussein ibn Ali. We can make a DVD. Simple, not difficult. And we can enter into the schools, the religious education, be it world religion classes, or be it human geography classes, they're always looking for good material, aren't they? Because the youth, when they enter into these classes, they don't really want to learn about religion. They're so brainwashed with creationism and atheism and Darwinism. There is a movement away from religion. We have to tackle, we have to provide them with something useful. It may just be that we can start with the grassroots now, entering into the schools, giving them material to play within the classrooms, to read, to take home with them. Is this not what the khums money is for? Why am I giving the khums money if it is not for these sorts of projects? To reach the grassroots, to introduce Hussein ibn Ali. There are, a statistic, one out of every 12 people, kids, in the United States of America, attends a faith-based school. One out of every 12. It's a huge number when you think about it, isn't it? It's not a small number. One out of every 12, 5 million of them, constantly in a faith-based school, which means that they're already inclined to faith-orientated discourse. Imagine if the leadership could arrive, we organically could arrive at creating something universal for these schools. And at the top level of our political and organizations and ulama could write the letters asking the faith-based schools to accept such and such a DVD, such and such a small pamphlet, such and such a small book. And we would like once in a year, similar maybe a month before the event of Muharram, before the event of Ashura, to come into each and every school and present this faith-based issue. You're already a faith-based school. You want to know about faith. We would like to introduce to you Hussein ibn Ali. Are they going to say no? The likelihood is not. The likelihood is not. They will not say no. They will invite. And even if only one out of five invite, no problem. We go to the grassroots and then we invite people to come. The same thing with our julus. Our julus still, still follows the same format as what it was 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago when we arrived in this country. The paradigm has changed. We haven't changed in kind. We still do the same things that we do 30 years ago, to the extent that with respect, the Julus doesn't really interest us. For the majority of our community, tell me if I'm wrong, the majority of our community, it doesn't really interest us because it's not achieving the goal as to what the Julus should be achieving. Maybe that style of Julus works in Pakistan. Is it working in London? Is that style working here? The Julus itself needs to be relative and relevant to our time. What if at the end, instead of just handing out the pamphlet, we said, when we arrive at the end point of our Julus, we have hired this building and we have asked a priest, we have asked uh, um, you know, uh, a pastor, we have asked someone from the Jewish community, the Sunni community to speak on this individual who we are asking you to know about. Instead of us just walking down the street doing ma'atam in Urdu 
and giving you bottles of water and maybe, you know, a samosa or whatever. What we're going to do in addition is give you this pamphlet and at the end of it, we're going to be here. Come join us at 6 p.m. Because we have people from around the faiths, not just our faith, wanting to introduce to you who Hussein ibn Ali was. We're not trying to convert you. Stay Christian. No problem. We just want you to introduce to this particular individual. What if we were to change the format and there was a priest and there was a pastor and there was a lady and there was a youth and we spoke Maybe 100 people might arrive. Maybe 1,000 people might arrive. But surely it is more than just doing the julus. There is an outcome, a measurable response to the julus. What is the ultimate thing that we can do in our community? Now here we're shooting for the stars. But we need to. Because we're worthy of doing it. We are the lovers of Ahlul Bayt. We should aim for best practice. We do it in our businesses, don't we? We do it in our organizations, best practice. Let us aim for best practice within the, within the dhikr of Hussein ibn Ali. Doesn't he not deserve that? What is the most outstanding thing we might be able to do in the West? Make a worthwhile film. A Karbala film. Which is not one which is something just for our DVD players. But it is a mainstream, going into the cinemas, blockbuster, that the rest of the world would want to go and watch. Why is a fictitious story of Braveheart and Gladiator so appealing when a true story of a real Braveheart and Gladiator not being told to the world? Why have we still not arrived at this point? How have we not asked the height of leadership to invest in this? How have we not got there? That the same way actor X is playing, actor X can also play for us. Is Hussein ibn Ali for us? He should be universal, correct? We want the world to believe him. We already believe in him. There's nothing you can do to me. You can tear me from limb from limb. I will still cry out, Ya Hussein. He's not for me. I already arrive at that point. He's for everybody else. Don't we want him to arrive at the height of what he deserves? His story can be told. Imagine today with what we have with true cinema, with true cinema, what we can do with computer, what we do with cinematography, what we do with soundtrack, what could be done for that moment where he takes Azghar into the battlefield. Will any mother or any father or any human being watching that be able to not shed a tear? Move from within for humanity's sake? Didn't the sixth imam say, he who sheds a tear, he who sheds a tear, the size of the wing of a gnat, all of his sins will be forgiven. Did that hadith become contextualized to the Shia of Ahlul Bayt? If a Sunni cries for Hussein ibn Ali, is he not rewarded? If a Christian were to cry for Hussein ibn Ali, would he not be rewarded? If mankind cried for Hussein ibn Ali, imagine where the world would be at. But we'll be faced with the same petty issues. No, it's not a Muslim playing it. You can't can't play it. No, you can't show the face of this individual. No, it's being directed by a non-Muslim. Really? Is that where we are still in the 21st century? I thought Hussein was for everybody. I thought he was universal. Al-Mahdi is universal. Quran says it. What does it say in the Holy Quran? The Holy Quran talks about the coming of the awaited Savior. It says, uh, The whole earth will glisten with the nur of the awaited Savior. There will be Christians, there will be Jews, they will still be there when the awaited Savior comes. All of them will submit. Why can't all of them wholeheartedly submit to Hussein ibn Ali? You don't have to believe in him as the Imam, but you can wholeheartedly submit with his story. That is where we want to arrive to. And if we, we start that movement, it may not happen today. 
But the same way a few years ago, the idea of who is Hussein campaign was started, the seed was buried, it became germinated, and it is beginning to flower. Maybe, just maybe, in our lifetimes, we will see the flowering of the height of what we want to achieve. But it happens here, it happens now, it happens with the inspiration of our youth. And it happens with them believing in the absolute standard of Hussein ibn Ali. There is nothing compared to it. La yawm ka yawmuk ya Aba Abdullah. If that is what Hassan al-Mujtaba said about him, imagine what I can say about him. Imagine what Sayyidah Zainab said about him. As... Yazid came to Zayn Rabidin alayhi salam and said, I want to release you. The tumult has taken place. Imam went back towards Sayyid Zainab and said, You place the conditions. Subhanallah. Look at the victory being placed here. One time individual, woman, grand lady who walks into Bazar al Sham with her arms bound having been whipped, having been hungry and thirsty, paraded without her veil, having been the one that boiling water was poured upon her, having had her hijab burnt when the plains in the camp was burnt, now she turns her state into victory. I, Zainab, place the conditions upon you. What a story, a legacy for a woman in Islam. To spread this around the world. I place the conditions. What are the conditions? We want a house where we can mourn for Hussein ibn Ali. We want our belongings back. Which belongings? They stole things that belonged to Fatima to Zahra. I want them back. They stole the cradle of Ali Azgar. I want the cradle back. And I want safe passage back to Karbala to bury the heads of the martyrs of the 10th of Muharram. As that occurred, Zayyid Zainab in Umm Kurthum gathered in a house of Damascus. The women folk of Damascus entered and they began to listen for seven days to the martyrdoms. They began to listen for seven days as to what took place as they gathered and eventually left. Where did they go? They began to leave to enter towards Karbala. As Zain al-Abideen was leaving, as he was leading the kafila back, he noticed that Lady Rabab, she was not with the kafila. Zain al-Abideen turns around and says, Wait, there is no Lady Rabab. We cannot leave. Where is Rabab? Sayyidah Zainab says, I know where Rabab will be. Let me go and find Rabab. She returns back where? She returns back into the prison cells of Damascus. Oh, Zainab, you have just been given freedom. You are returning back towards the prison cell. As she returns, what does she see? She sees Rabab standing over the grave of her daughter Sakina. Her face, her cheek is pressed up the dirt, the grave of her daughter Sakina. She is crying out, Oh Sakina, how can I gave an oath to your father Hussein that I would, le- I would look after you. How can I leave you all alone now? Zainab embraces Rabab and says, Oh Rabab, we must leave. She says, Where are we going? We are going back towards Karbala. I did not want to go to Karbala. There is my husband Hussein and there is my son Azhar. How can I return back to Karbala when they are buried there? Oh Zainab, my son Azgar, he is lying on the chest of his father Hussein. He at least has his father. Sakina, if I leave her, she will be all alone. We will say, No, by Allah, we have not left her alone. Rabab, we the Shia have not left her alone. Rabab is taken back towards Karbala as they enter. It is Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari that is performing the ziyarat. He leaves and allows them their time and space. There is a hadith that says that as Sayyid Zainab was being taken out of Karbala towards Kufa, as she was being led between the broken and torn bodies, she arrives at the torn body of Hussein. Which body? The body that has been trampled upon by the horse's hoops.
there were ten horsemen, that is forty hooves of the horses trampling upon the chest of Hussein. Which body? The body which is severed from its neck. Which body? The body which has its fingers being torn off from it. She approaches this body. She throws herself off from the camel. She looks towards the body and she asks a question. Oh Hussein, anta akhi? Are you really my brother? I cannot resemble you. When I saw you last, you had your head upon your shoulders. You had your fingers and your wrists were not severed. There is a scholar, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli, he says, I wonder what it must have been like for Sayyidah Zainab as she returned back towards Karbala. I imagine the same way she cried out, Anta Akhi, are you really my brother? When Hussein saw her sister, when Hussein saw his sister Zainab, her back was bent, her hair had become grey, she had been bludgeoned from the lashings by shimmer. What would Hussein have said when he had seen Zainab, would a voice from the grave have come out and said, Oh Zainab, are you really my sister? Because when I saw you last and I embraced you, you were not like this. Are you really my sister? It is Zainab in Umm Kurthum that head back towards Medina. As they head back towards Medina, they come. Sayyidah Umm Kurthum runs towards the grave of Rasulullah. She says, Oh Prophet, do not accept us. When we left you, we left you with all of our family and our protectors. We returned so forlorn and without a protector. Zainab goes towards her mother Fatima. She comes towards the grave. I wonder what Zainab must have said towards Fatima. What did she say first? Oh mother, I left you with my brother Hussein, but I returned empty-handed. Did she say, oh mother Fatima, did you see me in Kufa and Damascus? You are the one who recited your sermon in front of the enemies. Did you see your daughter Zainab? Were you proud of your daughter Zainab? She gave her own sermon in front of the enemies. Mother, did you observe me in the plains and in the bazaar? And then she must have gone back into the house. She would have seen her husband. She would have seen the two small prayer mats hanging in the house. She comes towards those prayer mats. These are the prayer mats of Aum and Muhammad. She doesn't cry until this moment. Now she can say, peace be upon you Aum. And peace be upon you Muhammad. Oh Zainab, they found you in sajda. Saying, shukran lillah. We said to you, oh Zainab, Zainab, if you had not cried for Oni Muhammad until this time, we will cry for Oni Muhammad until the end of time. Ala la'natullahi ala al-qawmi al-dhalimeen wa sayya'alamu al-lazheena dhalamu ayyum al-qalabi al-qalibun inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Please raise your hands and join us in du'a. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Saviour. We ask you, Allah, allow us to be alongside Him at all times in our life and in our death. We ask for you, Allah, if we are to pass away from this world before his coming, raise us from our graves so that we may partake in the victory of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask for you, Allah, allow us to perform the ziyarat of Imam Zain al-Abideen, Sayyid Zainab and Abi Abdullah this year and every year. We ask for you, Allah, there are many people around the world who are in uh, such desperate times, especially our brothers and sisters in Syria, in Bahrain, in Palestine. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, in Egypt, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Ya Allah, grant them safety, security, victory for the sake of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask you, Ya Allah, there is much work that we wish to do for your sake. All of us have something to offer. We wish to take the Who is Hussein platform and take it to its next heights. Ya Allah, grant us the inspiration, the time, the tawfiq, the drive, the passion and the desire to partake in this particular movement. We ask you, Ya Allah, allow us to understand the movement of Hussein ibn Ali in the final moments of our life. We die in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Matima Hussein. Ya Hussein.